The debate about large, dangerous wildlife in India. Should it be managed? Should it be fenced? What value does it have? Should it be priced? Is as complicated as the subcontinent itself. Here are the views of four people involved in the argument. First up, Dr. H.S. Pabla, formerly of the Madhya Pradesh Forestry Department, who is in favour of wildlife management, and Dr. M.K. Ranjit Singh, who helped write India's 1972 Wildlife Protection Act. Would you say you disagree with each other on the core idea of hunting? Is, is that fair to characterise? Can I ask you that? No, it's the application. You see, if uh, the local people... It, again, there is no one common answer. You have to vary it yes. from place to place. The, place the problems place. are different. We will hear more from these two later. Those who are against the consumptive use of wildlife in India tend to characterise the nation as fiercely anti-hunting. Here's Rajiv Matthew. There was a time when hunting was legal in India, up to about uh, 1991, where you could buy uh, permits, buy licences and you could shoot, especially for wild boar and things like that. And after 91, everything uh, kind of uh, went into a tailspin. I basically advise the government as to what problems are with wildlife and how they can be uh, controlled in the sense that we, we came from a time of paucity of uh, wild animals. Now we have uh, many, not as many as we would like to have, but we don't have the uh, available habitats. So my advice is how to manage the populations, uh, not necessarily hunting. In fact, in some of the cases I've asked them to translocate uh, prey base to the area first and then take the carnivores out. So it works and um, I think some of them are now following that uh, principle. Hunting, um, there are many aspects of hunting. Hunting um, for commercial purposes, hunting to destroy uh, man-eaters, they all have different um, priorities and paradigms. And the third would be, uh, should be hunt animals, which uh, are not dangerous to human life, but harmful to human property. Or should we have other alternatives? It, it's a question of alternatives. Doctors Pabla and Ranjit Singh are speaking at a conference in April 2023 in Kanha in central India on exactly this topic. What is the future of managing wildlife populations in India? I, I'm happy with whatever makes people safer and wildlife valuable. So we would never talk about this subject before. We always talk about uh, wildlife management as in terms of simple protection that's all, or an anti-poaching. Now the time, uh, first time where we are discussing how to manage populations. Maybe the method is not yet acceptable, approach may not be acceptable, but I think the gradual process takes time. These are a question of attitudes and uh, hard-grained uh, attitudes take time. But I think starting a discussion is very important. It wasn't a popular choice of topic, was it? But it was necessary to talk about this subject. And it's, it's very good to have different viewpoints expressed um, from both sides, from two ends, as it were. Cubs are the main reason for increase in tiger and uh, leopards. And they are moving out. And uh, with tigers and leopards, there's also something called the ripple effect. The ripple effect is that the tiger numbers are increasing. Earlier, they were in core and now they are slowly moving out. And as they are moving out, they are pushing the leopards out. So the leopards are getting into the rural and the peri-urban and even the urban areas. So you have a, a typical ripple effect. Under its wildlife protection rules, India takes a strict view on what it calls protected areas. In some of them, the government forces local people to move. The concept of protected areas is divided into three. The national parks, the conservation reserves and the reserve forests. Now the reserve forests are areas where there is human encroachment, human movement and everything and these are uh, mosaic with villages. The uh, conservation reserves are a little more stricter, tighter and the national parks are uh, literally no-go zones for people. It's, they are actually emptying out people from these national parks I don't know whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, but uh, that's what's happening. They cut out electricity and water. So when you cut out the basic 
amenities to the people, they would happily move out. And where are they moving out? If we go and ask them, then we will know what's happening. We haven't, uh, I mean, I would love to do that at some point in time. Because I have seen a lot of uh, distress amongst people. And in a couple of cases, people have tried to go back to their old uh, villages. The human population is growing. We, are, we have now beaten China uh, and we have become the best and the, and the first in the world, <laughs> population-wise. So yeah, we, we are breeding, the animals are breeding and they don't, they don't say, oh yeah, we have got food, there's a food constraint, so we will keep our populations down. Neither human beings are doing it, nor are the animals doing it. So yep, we are going to, and wildlife conflicts is, and habitat management are going to be the two major reasons for conflicts in India. Do we have the right to keep on increasing because we are increasing? Or do we have, a, uh, do we have to say in this area, no go. This belongs, this 4% area belongs to the other citizens of India. They are citizens and they have as much right as you have in that area. And that is recognized today. I have asked a number of times, <coughs> your cow has been killed. He said, yes, but the tiger also has a right to live. We have accepted that. We have that tolerance. Do we want to negate it? We have got a lot of cattle, stray cattle. And we've got a lot of stray dogs. Now, these are the two animals that are fueling uh, leopard and uh, tiger populations. Both these animals, the, uh, which are basically domestic animals, are fueling wild, wild cat uh, numbers. So you have a problem with the dogs that is spreading diseases amongst the wild animals, being prey to leopards because leopards love dogs. And because of which now we are seeing uh, four cubs to a leopard, leopardess. Four cubs to a leopardess was unheard of. We used to see one and possibly two and one would die anyway. So it's, we have, we have multiplied it by four. Latika Nath is a tiger expert who has a clear view of why human wildlife conflicts are increasing in India. It's happening because we've been trying to double the population of the mega species without actually studying carrying capacity and how to change carrying capacity within protected areas. So when you have huge populations growing within limited spaces, there's a natural spillover. And the spillover is into spaces where there's not enough natural prey, leading to an increase in conflict with uh, pastoralists and agriculturists societies where you have cattle and you have uh, livestock that serves as food for the big cats and um, crops that are attractive to the big uh, herbivores and elephants and things like that. And that's where the problem happens. When people go to work in farms, farmers, um, they take their children with them and they put them in small little uh, hammocks, cradles if you will, uh, and leave them there. So sometimes uh, animals will pick them up from there. Uh, in the evenings, usually the, the children are playing around at home and leopards come into villages and take them. Leopards travel, get into villages and leopards have a very curious uh, behavior. And this is what masks this uh, scent. Uh, leopards roll in dung. So they wear, they absolutely have a vanishing cream for a coat and they add some more vanishing cream which doesn't smell or it smells like village cattle or something like that. So they easily pass through all the stray dogs and street dogs in villages. So they are able to camouflage themselves by scent and by sight. On the flip side, people go very angry when a man-eater is not removed. So what is happening, and now that the courts have got involved, people are actually calling uh, poachers in, the villagers are calling poachers in, and they take not one animal, they take several animals, and most of the time, the culprit is left behind. The culprit never gets in. The people uh, affected are, of course, the ones who matter. If you ask them, would you like to kill them or would you like them shifted, they will most probably say, if you can take them away, we'd be happy. Translocating large number of animals as a crop protection measure to relieve the pressure on crops is, has not worked anywhere. And wherever we have tried, we have failed. 
uh, both because it's so expensive that is exorbitant you can't be a go beyond a limited thing and uh, states like uh, uh, andhra pradesh maharashtra they have translocated thousands of black bucks from uh, crop lands in, into forests none of them have survived there are no black buck population in the forest now and uh, the problem has not been solved that the equal number of uh, animals there are the crops they have to be they have to be different solution and solution is that you use them as, as a as a secondary harvest and uh, whatever losses are people taking from from, from uh, the crop raiding maybe they, they can be compensated by whatever income can be drawn from a regulated community based uh, exploitation program and uh, which people then people maybe may be welcome more animal around them rather than try to hate them whatever wildlife has to be managed has to be managed on habitat habitat and biodiversity are prime all the other uh, components and the constituents that make up that biodiversity are to be sub optimally held to make that biodiversity function and function properly because uh, we have to also look at the ecosystem goods and services which is not really talked about most of the people talk about uh, one animal or two animals and that doesn't actually save the uh, serve the purpose i think that people who live on the edge of areas where there is an increase in human wildlife conflict would definitely support measures to remove problem animals and i think if that was the way you started it would be much more acceptable so you don't use the word hunting this is reduction or removal of conflict then it suddenly becomes acceptable and if at the same time marginalized societies on the edge of protected areas get economic benefit get tangible perceived economic benefit from sustainable use of wildlife that could be a game changer it's a very big step but the way to win the confidence of the people would be to first tackle the really hard hit areas where there are problem animals and help resolve those issues and it would have to be a combination of removing the problem animals and granting further protection to those communities uh using fencing you you know electric fencing using pepper sprays using sticks with tasers you know you you need to think out of the box and and train people to deal with encounters with big animals and and ensure that the local government and uh, the police forces are all trained in handling big cat and big animal encounters sugar cane is often used by tigers for protection then you would just fence that sugar cane field so the tiger doesn't enter it uh, the choices have to be exploited one is we are talking about the milieu and the mental attitude and i am um, a little wary of uh, putting a price tag on animals it's very fine very well with africa and and, and look different uh, as i said earlier uh, you know in some muslim countries the only way to protect um uh, the animals there whether it is in kyrgyzstan or where the marco polo sheep are whether they are in, in pakistan where the markhor are and elsewhere is to involve the local communities because they are the hunters and they need to be literally bought off and the the buying off is uh, through giving money to the community because they are very community oriented um clan clan oriented and uh, there are uh, chieftains who are uh, overlords and their word is is law so they 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 bid for certain areas and they ensure that uh, no poaching takes place and in the in in the bargain the government gives them permission to shoot 
x number of trophies which uh, uh, they they choose and the clients shoot and take away the trophy the money remains uh, with the community but the chieftain keeps a big big part of it the government gets its revenue by way of uh, uh, fees the license fees but most important of all they are able to achieve conservation without involving their own staff to that extent because the, uh, outside staff would not be able to stop the local people from the, they uh, you know they all have weapons and uh, some of them um, can even make their own weapons like in afghanistan the first thing that has to be done is we have to bring in sustainable use as a component we have to bring in wildlife management as a component and um, we should also take into uh, account that certain animals that have been pushed out of their territories have to be taken out that is you hunt them you destroy them you do whatever you want to, to do with them i am not here sitting in judgment as to say whether it's to be trophy hunted or eaten or whatever but if you take them out the younger animals will have space the younger animals are the ones that are actually killing people today so it is the younger animals uh, that have to be contained so the older animals have spread their genes they have they have lived their lives and there is no reason why they cannot be taken out and for one animal's territory you can actually have two more animals the smaller animals the younger animals living together and even if the younger ones have to move they will move slowly they will not here there is a pressure on them the older animals will kill them so they are running away from uh, for their lives they are running for their lives and they are running through the nalas the streams the canals and all that and that is where you find people people and uh, cattle are either drinking water or washing their clothes or having a bath or something like that and that is where people get killed the other thing is that people also get killed while they are harvesting their crops and there it's probably a kilometer two kilometers away from the forest so that is where the angst is the local people do not want a tiger in their midst uh, at mid noon i mean who would dream of a tiger at mid noon in their uh, property in their fields my, my main concern would be that now wildlife populations are growing the problems of people are going to grow we have to have a strategy in place before it becomes go overhead so uh, wherever populations are growing in a, in a dangerous places they have to be reduced in time if translocation is a solution which i think is not in many places uh, of course it should be used and if they have to be eliminated uh, through a process of uh, either we call hunting or sustainable use whatever then that option should be on table because people if they don't want wildlife around them if they suffering from wildlife naturally wildlife is no future i would not tell you no sir <laughs> you have to pay a price for instance some of the lions are a nuisance they are living off the shore do, do we cut them do we take them away do we capture them do we get foreigners to pay 30000 dollars to kill them uh, <clears throat> all over gujarat they are walking around the place <laughs> it is a national animal once in the symbol do we do that with the tiger or do we do it we differently uh, treat uh, species differently elephants for instance elephant is sacred try shooting an elephant let him try and shoot an elephant for community <laughs> in africa it is lovely meat biltong jerk meat <coughs> here you try to ganesh you will have a revolution on hand so i don't think it's about introducing the word hunting into india it's just that for the last 75 years since independence for much of the time we've been told that it's all about preservation that it's such a big battle against a really e rapidly expanding human population that conservation is not the answer preservation is and that that combined with the fact that people worship animals and animal gods so you have the elephant god ganesha um you have 
the goddess Durga who rides on her tiger, to, to tell people that you're going to be killing the, the ride of goddess Durga or the elephant god Ganesh becomes really difficult. And this is a largely Hindu country and we, we have a very close knit connection with our gods. We have hundreds of gods. And throughout the religion, there is this close connect with animals and nature. So it becomes very difficult. The word hunting has many connotations for, for Indian people. One, of course, we just spoke about, which is the fact that it goes against religious beliefs and the principle of nonviolence and living in harmony with nature. But it also has a lot to do with the fact that in the old days, it was just the royalty, the privileged castes and the, the foreigners who actually went out and organized hunts. And there was this whole movement against this very group in, this, in society. And to now say that you're going to open hunting again, you know, has all of these connotations that it's again going to be the rich and the elite that are going to have something else to do. And many perceive it to be at the cost of the, the lower sections of society, the poorer backward sections of society. There must have been a one for the pot culture here amongst the, amongst uh, all the people. No, but it's only to, in a certain segment of society. It's the exception more than the norm. We have a huge population that's vegetarian. And we have a huge population that doesn't live on the edge of wildlife areas. So it would only be the meat-eating population living on the edge of a wildlife area that would have actually shot one for the pot. That too completely illegally and at great peril to their own lives and their own, uh, you know, livelihoods because it was completely illegal to hunt game that belonged on a landlord's estate or a, on a king's lands. We were a hunting community in the sense that the elite, the princes and the British uh, thing and those who could afford it could hunt but it was uh, the local people acquiesced in it. They did not support it. They didn't have the courage to oppose it. Um, and they look the other way. We are very good at looking the other way at times, most times. Um, and that's how we survive. Can, but we, can, can I ask Dr. Prabhu, do you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, please. Is, is, that, is it fair to say that, that there is likely to be little support from the Indian population for hunting in, in any form? I think... Uh, not exactly the people who are victims of uh, success and conservation who are paying the price they would be happy They're already killing animals and they will continue to kill and if you regulate it through regulation where uh, maybe limited offtake which can be replaced uh, which can replace rampant poaching that will ultimately benefit i think we have to demonstrate and show to the people that conservation can also be uh, a uh, painless exercise rather than being a, uh, a nuisance day in and day night. Preservation is up to a point where you preserve everything as is. But beyond a point, it becomes untenable. It becomes also a, a human rights issue. So we cannot have a, a forever having a, something like a preservation policy. Preservation policies work. Not saying it doesn't work, but after a time, it does not work. And what's happening is the poachers take away whatever there is. And um, the prayer of a poacher and the prayer of a forester is almost same and to the same God. It is the poacher prays, let me not meet a forester. The forester prays, let me not meet a poacher.
Uh, I think uh, we have to present uh, both sides of the story to the government and government has to make, make its choice. The, the, the conservation is very complicated and we are a very complicated society as well. The animals <laughs> which, which are a pain for us, they are also sacred. So naturally those people who are suffering or those who revere them, they have to make a choice. So the, maybe some species there is no question, like wild pig. So they, they are all over the country, even places where we haven't seen them for hundreds of years in Punjab, in my own place. Now they are ravaging the croplands. So uh, that, that's simple. But those animals which are revered by the people, which have religious connotations, naturally society has to take a more nuanced uh, approach. Like say, elephants. In areas, some areas, I mean elephants kill more people than all the other animals uh, put together in India. So how long can you let that continue to grow, this one? And how long can you expect those people uh, to tolerate it? It's, it's not my child or, or her, his child or your child being, being affected. It's, it's the poor, poor people. People live with so much trouble and so much pain and so much grief when you're from a particular segment of society living on the edge of these areas where there's huge amounts of conflict that the people themselves will run to you for help should you offer it. So far, we haven't put a value to an animal. And if you put a value, I think you are devaluing it because to a lot of people, they are priceless. For more on this story, go to fieldsportschannel.tv slash tiger.